and some of those which were not covered uh, this morning, particularly And I 
I'm taking it so seriously that it's been introduced in the, the university uh, with the approval of colleagues without even imposing it. And uh, it's being uh, received by students uh, who stop questioning the validity or the, or the, even the uh, uh, authenticity of the structure of the site. Which means I'm trapped. That means we have to continue with it. It's no longer a game. And the game is one of scientific activities.
scientifically, translation precedes any human science or humanity. Without that, we would not have had any access of any human knowledge. So, the thought is put on the floor, discuss it, refuse it, defeat it, bury it, hug it, uh, spit on it, do whatever it is. Translation is the foremost discipline. It means, like any science, when you come out with a new discipline, you have to defend it, and the only way to defend it is by being fanatic. Fanaticism is one of the prerequisites for being a scientist, let alone a theoretician. So, before we uh, before you start shooting, I'm admitting my fanaticism and proud of it. <laughs> Sixthly, why translatics and not just translation or theory of translation? Because there are three different things. Translation is a byproduct. Theory of translation is speculation on that product, commercialization of that product. Translatics is the science which studies all. Linguistics was doubtfully accepted as a science. And we still raise a question. We have to prove that it is a science. And therefore, we have to go to all the other disciplines to prove that it is science that it uses the tools of, of the sciences. Therefore, it is science. I find translatics prepared to use all scientific tools as competently as the other science. To abbreviate the, uh, the uh, assumption, to abridge the assumption, let me say that out of translatics, you can have all your hyphenated but socio-translating, psycho-translating, neuro-translating, and geo-translating, and so on. Right. The, uh, the most, the most uh, useful hyphenated word for the time being for me is neuro. Uh, you, uh, you, have a, you have a handout. I would help you. There are some, there are some terms that I've described, including translating what it means and so on. But some of the things I look. This is only one part of the, uh, the lexicon, the lexicon of translation, and it's it's uh, being it's being handed out for the first time. <coughs> for the first time, so nobody has ever looked at this before. Not even the the students who are taking the course. For the first time, but yes, I, I have a so I, I yes. The uh, the lexicon of the terminology is is long, many faceted, and it it is all involving practical. I said the most, uh, the most uh, reliable or the most, uh, uh, the most uh, sensible uh, uh, for the time being hyphenated word for me is neuro, neuro. Uh, if we look at the, uh, the brain and the functions of the brain with regard to language activities. The left hemisphere, as you know, contains the compartments or the areas for language activities. 
um, two main areas, broadcast area and the other one, the furniture, furniture area, uh, which deal with comprehension and speech comprehension and speech expression. There is nothing about there's nothing about uh, writing or reading or so, uh, which uh, even makes me think of the uh, interpretation of the prophet's description. Uh, it starts from the demand itself, which has no compa no 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 reserved compassion for reading or writing, only for speaking, for speech and comprehension. So uh, therefore. The relationship between the two compartments is that of translation and conveying the speech activity involving translation. Yeah. Translation is not discarded from concept, it is included, but it becomes, as you see, it becomes uh, uh, drowned in another concept so that it no longer belongs to any aspect of the English. So, this morning we were all worried about where it belongs and all that. So, it belongs somewhere else. Not only that, but it's going to become instrumental for the other, for the other disciplines. Sixthly, uh, I'm saying numbers, I'm not looking at them. Seventhly, seventhly, oh, sixthly, seventh, seventhly. So that uh, uh, if, if translatics is, uh, is to become a sign of translation, and not theory of translation, uh, I'm discussing. So it might have its theoretical and applied aspects also. But it's very difficult for me at this time to say to think of the theoretical aspect. I have to admit. It is a clinician, uh, clinician's approach to all the aspects that are involved, <coughs> involving in the, in the approach. It has to be clinical in the sense that there are practical aspects in the, uh, in the course. I'm not saying the teaching, but in in real life situation where we be uh, be it uh, daily conversation, day to day conversation, be it a, a, a bilateral relation between two partners or negotiation or a text to be carried over from one topic to another, be it a newspaper article, or whatever, it involves it involves translation. Uh, I refer to Revelation, the book of Revelation, book of Anne and the Bible, and the Torah as being some of those. The translation starts from there, and the translation from there, so it's translated. But the Tzvenir is, uh, is, uh, is that. And with, with that, you would have, uh, you would have uh, uh, to involve the other uh, qualities or defects or faithfulness or treason or uh, amena, amena, and, uh, amena, 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 Translatics is a uh, uh, approach, but it's scientific, to the uh, numerous processes involved in translation. Uh, some, some of these uh, uh, processes are described on page, uh, page one of the uh, handout. Uh, I've taken those which are trans Transbound in the sense that we are dealing with everything that is a trans, so there is a transfer and a transferee and a transference and a transducing and a transformation and a transform and a 
transposition and the transcodation this morning. This morning, uh, uh, Dr. Williams was speaking of the problem of code, and uh, I was looking at that as well, where, where the uh, uh, <coughs> linguistic item or the cultural item is being transposed from one language into the other, from one environment to another, of Ibrahim's concern, whether it's the culture that he has carried over or the, or the, or the, uh, or the linguistic element. It's the entire, the entire. Uh, eighthly, uh, the problem of reading, reading the, uh, uh, the text involves a uh, multifaceted uh, approach, which I refer to as the, the poly, a poly legibility of the text. So that the text itself, to which we have given a, an entity this morning, with which you have to negotiate, which has, which puts its own conditions of being transferred, allows for this uh, numerous uh, forms of reading or polylegibility which are not assigned by the translator, but revealed by the text itself. Uh, I would like to, to close with, uh, with one uh, important issue in the, uh, in the field, and, and that is the uh, technical problems facing the operation of transfer. Some of them have been mentioned uh, this morning as the uh, uh, noun, verb, gender, number, passive voice. And, uh, are these technical aspects or inherent features of the, of the uh, language from which we are transferring, which have to be to be uh, taken into account in the uh, in the target language. We uh, tend to assume that there are universals. The only universal I can uh, start with in this uh, respect and translating concept is the existence of a of a tag or the lad of the path, the translation acquisition device. You are born with that, new, new uh, translatics allows for it. And once you have acquired those, once you have exercised those devices, you will be able to not only uh, carry those uh, features or those peculiarities, idiosyncrasies we have raised this morning, but you will be as well able to locate the proper or the adequate uh, slot in the target language for that particular for that particular feature. I should stop here. I know that the uh, discussion, I'm glad the discussion <coughs> is long enough to, to allow for possibility of adding more of what you have what one has said. You have you have the samples of uh, of concepts in front of you and we shall be happy to respond to your reactions. Well, thank you very much Professor. One 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 final answer we're going to be ten and I said nine and now the tenth one. Tenth one is one of the prerequisites morning so we talk about the, uh, the, uh, the translators role. Mr. Abu Ankara said that uh, he must know both languages. It's not the knowledge of two languages, it's the knowledge of the system of language in general, language system, and the systems of the language he's working with and the 
ability to to move. Uh, it's, not, it's not code switching. This is uh, uh, translated mobility within the language systems to which uh, Imam Shatibi and I, and I borrow the expression from him which I insert in concept is uh, concept in Muwafaqat is Stiwa Nisanayn for me that is Lingulibriyum on that note we go with these ten comments thank you very much session, uh, I think you will have to be prepared to curtail your presentations so that they can fit into the time limit. Thank you. So okay, this paper is uh, about a uh, note on, on translatability viewed from, uh, from two perspectives, linguistic and cultural. So let us start first by giving a, a definition of translation, which we give a starting point upon which I'm going to base my perspective on translator. First, uh, translation is uh, an operation where the translator has to acquire the technique of transferring smoothly between two basic translation processes. First, decoding the SL text, then re-encoding the text into an equivalent text of the target language. The first operation of decoding may involve an intelligible comprehension of the text and an accurate and careful interpretation of the linguistic signs. In other words, the translator should be competent enough to decode the linguistic system as well as language behavior of the source language and target language. The second phase of translation process is the re-encoding. The re-encoding stage, or what Newmark 1988 terms as formulation and recreation, and which they may call retrieval and substitution. So the translator at this stage switches to his knowledge of the target language in order to retrieve the linguistic material available for the substitution in the building up of the target language text. For this purpose, the translator is also required to show competence both linguistically and pragmatically of the target language to ensure an equivalent effect strategy in the reader with respect to the translated text. So then the translator's craft lies first in his command for an exceptionally large vocabulary as well as all syntactic resources, his ability to use them elegantly, flexibly, and successful. All translation problems finally resolve themselves into problems of how to write well in the target language. So the question may arise here is the question which we may ask in the following. How do translators translate? How do translators translate? Syntactically, semantically, or communicative. These three hierarchical components of language system and language behavior actually cooperate to mitigate the translation operation and they represent, in fact, kernel sources for the problems of translations and the continuum of the end transability. So, for this purpose, 
I will examine two aspects of problem translation. The first aspect is linguistic and translatable and translatability. And the second is cultural and translatability. What I mean by linguistic and translatability is the involvement of syntax and semantics being our sources for problems of translation. We start first by the syntax or syntactic problems. Since the sentence is usually the basic translation unit, the sentence is the basic translation unit, structural problems of translation usually crop up from differences in the type and the family to which both the source language and the target language belong. For example, for this purpose we can see Greenberg 62 and Combe 81 for universals. So for this purpose, the structural difficulty of translation is measured, is measured by the following criteria. Whether the language is configurational or non-configurational, whether the language is concatenative or non-concatenative, whether the language is poorly inflected or heavily inflected. So uh, an example of configurational language, English, French, and family alike, non-configurational, non-concatenative, and heavily inflected is the case of Arabic and perhaps some other Semitic languages. The first problem we can talk about is the problem of word order, which we, we measured this morning. The problem of word order moving from the source language to the tiger language. We have in mind, we can have in mind that English and Arabic. So an SVO or VSO language, for example, two orders. For English we have SVO and for Arabic we allow two possible word order, either SVO or VSO. Uh, a marked order and an unmarked order. So why translate it from English, for example, into Arabic? The translation should take into consideration the VSO possibility and the SVO possibility, not only on the syntactic level, but also on the communicative level. Why, for example, shall we prefer SVO or VSO for a certain purpose of translation? For example, in Ja'a Rijaru or Rijaru Ja'u, why, for example, we can uh, prefer, we prefer Ja'a, the Rijaru, which is an uh, uh, unmarked word order, and a rijalu jahu, which is a little bit marked because there's a case of emphasis on the topic and topicalization process. So why translating the English sentence into an Arabic sentence, the translator should take into consideration this kind of uh, uh, word order question. The second point, which can be uh, a point, uh, a source of uh, uh, problem of transformation, again, is the transformation of rules in syntax. So the translation should be aware of the transformational repertoire of both source language and target language and their bearing on translation process and their contribution in maintaining the vocative function of language. In this case, for example, neither in 66 and 69 adapts transformational grammar by proposing eight model corner sentences as transformational stages between source and target language structures. Other operational rules on the level of basic sentence structure are of great importance to the translator's syntactic knowledge. Among these rules, for example, we take the topicalization rule. We take the English sentence, for example, for example Mary, I saw yesterday, topicalization example. Uh, uh, take this location, for example, Mary, I saw her yesterday, love this location. Uh, Mary, I saw her yesterday. Mary, write this location. Extra position rule. It is difficult to translate this passage. Cleft sentences or clefting. It is John who did the work. So these, uh, these kind of rules, syntactic rules, uh, the structural and translability and translatability lies in, in how these syntactic rules are realized in both SL the S, uh, source language and uh, target language, depending on the directionality of the translation process 
and not whether they are allowed by language X or not. So similarly, stylistics and construal rules, compare for example, uh, Chomsky and Lassen in 1977, control our filters, experienced the same problem with regard to translation. A problem of preserving the communicative function, perhaps the vocative function of language, and the communicative input of the translation, uh, the, the, the translated text. Another problem uh, resides in the syntactic categories of both languages. Syntactic categories in standard Arabic, such as example, verbs, nouns, adjectives, inflect for number, gender, masculine, and feminine. So the case to point here is agreement with number. For example, we have a, a singular, dual, plural in Arabic. With plural, with different kind of morphological changes concerning the plural. So, while moving from English to Arabic or vice versa, to uh, translate a dual form of a noun, there is a problem uh, while moving from Arabic to English in order to preserve the meaning of the dual, since the dual is not lexicalized in English, not lexicalized. Uh, another problem is the problem of the pronouns. We take the English pronoun you can be either singular or plural. In Arabic, you may mean anta, anti, antuma, antum, antun. So this kind of moving from you to this kind of paradigm concerning the second person, or even the third person, they, for third persons, uh, plural uh, in English and Arabic, <coughs> they may be huma, tuul, hunna, hum, and so on. So this, uh, this non-mapping, of the uh, pronoun system in English or Arabic may, uh, may lead the, uh, uh, the translator to uh, either to an over-translation or to an under-translation. We move to the next point concerning semantic or lexical and translatability. What I mean by lexical uh, and translatability, the fact is that it is due to the, to the fact that a lexical item is either plainly or approximatively missing in a particular culture or particular language. For this purpose, I will examine two uh, kind of aspects. Non-lexicalization of the cultural item, plainly missing, and cultural implication. The non-existence of a cultural item, non-existence of a particular cultural item in a particular community entails automatically the non-lexicalization of that item in the lexicon of that language, both theoretically and functionally. For example, we take the Moroccan culture, or Arab culture, for Zuleva, Nal, Al-Bulha, Shirbil, for example. Uh, if you look at some touristic booklet, you find that he translates Bulha and Shirbil as the babouche. The babouche, Western civilization is not the Bulha or the Shirbil. And the same way, if we want to translate Sarawak Kandrisa, and I referred to Professor Bhutan years ago, maybe in the Jadid al conference, who proposes that for the English speaker, how can we translate, for example, Sarawak Kandrisa? Bloomers. <laughs> he proposed a long time ago that bloomers, that bloomers for the English uh, speaker, the native speaker, what is bloomers? It, it is a kind of imaginative word that be devolved of any cultural item. I, I propose that because uh, there was a baggy there. Yes, a baggy trousers. Someone said on the tablet. Yes, rumors, but, but the uh, cultural item rumors in English may have been different from the rumors we have and the, the function of rumors in our particular community. Since these items are not culturally perceived as English or Anglo-Saxon cultural items, the translation of these items into English remains, of course, a, a delicate case. There is a, a, a very interesting article uh, uh, concerning that, what we call an antagonistic acculturation by Duflo and Evelo, which is a very interesting article to, on this topic. What are cultural inflection? Com Cultural applicators for me are the social connotations given by a particular community to a particular cultural item 
with a positive or negative other terms or value judgment. Like, for example, we have here fundak. <coughs> so, the conceptual meaning of the fundak is straightforward. But the cultural overtone, fundak, is something negative. It's known as So, this is what I mean by cultural implications or cultural overtones. And this is the problem for the translator. If the translator is not quite familiar with these overtones, there is a failure in translation. A failure in translation. So, in these cases, transference, maybe substitution or definition, or perhaps paraphrase, or perhaps replacement remain approximate, if not not. We move to the, uh, the last point concerning cultural and translatability. Well, we have to examine here two, uh, 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 briefly we have to examine two cases, the case of metaphors and the case of ignorance. So given the close relationship between language and culture, of course, language being a recipient of cultural items, and the community or the natural environment offering images and cultural constructs in creating metaphors and other figures of speech, we may conclude perhaps that two different languages may entail two different cultures, and two different cultures may entail two different modes of metaphors. In that case, conventional metaphors and sayings, perhaps proverbs, should be conventionally translated. In other words, technical terms, terms of art, formula, the set language of institution, procedures, games, <coughs> Fatic communal language, must be translated by the equivalent TL standard term, if that exists. For example, when we, uh, we have this metaphor of sab in Arabic, we say, or ya sabra ayyub, for example, these expressions which are more or less you know, uh, taken from the cultural environment, history, the community as a whole. So uh, 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 if we translate these metaphors as such, we will not be faithful enough to, uh, uh, to, the, the, to, the, uh, to the meaning carried uh, out, the image carried out by the metaphor. So either we have to find an equivalent metaphor and the target language, or we may resort to uh, a translation of the metaphor, and for this purpose we can, uh, you can refer you to uh, uh, Numax 1988. For example, I have an example here uh, from Coudoyer les gens in French, Coudoyer les gens, uh, parallel to Rap shoulders with in English, Rap shoulders with, Coudoyer les gens, which means mixed with. So, if there is no TL standard equivalent, of course, the translator has to look for a compensation for the metaphor. We have the example again for the uh, conventional or cultural and translatability, the letter writing in Arabic culture, the strategies, the conventions. And here I, I refer to Professor Oisha in a talk given in France, I think, two years ago, about this uh, kind of writing letters cultural letters. So if we compare uh, a, a letter, a model of letter written in Arabic, in Fandi, and so on and so forth, and so on, you know that you are familiar with this law, you know, maybe redundant letter in, in, in Arabic, which is loaded with cultural items. It's a bit difficult to translate this letter into an English version, but pertaining, trying to preserve as much as possible the meaning of the letter moving from the source language to the target language. The last stage in this uh, phenomenon and uh, uh, translatability, uh, as far as culture is concerned, is the problem of idioms. Again, idioms are phrases or word groups whose meaning cannot be elicited from the separate meanings of each word of which they are formed. So, so, so they are the kind of fossilized fossilized language, idioms, pneumatic expressions, progress perhaps, and so on. So then idioms can never be translated word for word, since idioms are either colloquial or slang. It is often difficult to find a TL equivalent with the same degree of informality and the same degree of cultural learning. If we take, for example, the famous idiom in English, kick the bucket in English, for example, 
you translate this into Arabic, either you have to find an equivalent, uh, equivalent proverb, perhaps. <laughs> so this kind of moving from uh, a fossilized, so the problem is that we move from a fossilized uh, block of language to another fossilized block in the target language. So finally, to conclude then the phenomena of untranslatability is relative and represents a kind of continuum of gradual loss of meaning. Maybe an under translation, over translation, mistranslation, and finally the end is untranslatable. The worst case of untraceability to end with are purely conversional and not and or cultural. In the world of literature, the most case of untranslatability is the one voiced by Robert Frost himself. Poetry is the untranslatable element. Thank you. Now we will move on to another paper which which is inspired by this axis translation in practice and presented by Dr. Moussaber from the Faculty of Letters Rabat entitled Teaching Translation in an English Department Retrospects and Prospects. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> in my presentation I'm going to bring you down from the lofty Theory to the more pedestrian problem of the teaching of translation. Or how does the transfer between the haves and have nots take place? From those like you who have this amount of knowledge, to those who come to our institutions in order to see uh, ways and means in order to become translators. In order to do that, I would like to give you my own account of the experience of. Um, myself and my colleagues in the English department for about over the past 10 years with the translation course, especially at the level of the third year. In our department, I believe as is the case in most departments, we have two, uh, two courses, one in the fourth year and one in the third year. And um, in, in terms of stopping, these courses in our department were uh, initially stopped by whoever could handle Languages. Whoever could handle Arabic and English uh, was given the task of uh, training uh, people in uh, becoming proficient in uh, translation. Graduate people who had training in linguistics or are more into uh, translation studies uh, started to um, uh, take care of these courses, especially at the level of 30. Predictably, the teacher's training determines the orientation given to the course. Over the years, there seems to have occurred a shift in the teaching of translation in the third year, a course that was taught by uh, a number of people over uh, these years. And my survey, the teaching material used, and the end of the year exams given uh, convinced me that whereas in the past when this course was staffed by literature people, the tendency was to view translation as an art and craft and to select teaching material on the basis of the general interest rather than on the basis of its structural difficulties. More recently, as the course is staffed by colleagues whose training is mostly in linguistics, translation Translating is viewed as a skill, and the material used to teach that skill is selected on the basis of its linguistic uh, complexity or simplicity, and of its representativity uh, in terms of discourse types. Theoretically, all groups cover the same material, and instructors are supposed to coordinate in order to, um, to share the teaching uh, material, and that's as far as they can go in uh, trying to secure some uh, type of uniformity. Course objectives, as stated in the course descriptions uh, from 1980 to 92, there have four points on which colleagues seem to agree, and the first one is, the first objective is to introduce translation as a dynamic and creative process. 
The second, to bring the student to feel and respect the genius of both languages, Arabic and English. The third point, to teach the student how to remain faithful to the original text without falling into the servility of literal translation. And fourth, to give the student uh, systematic graduate training and by way of preparing the student for uh, the end of the year exam. The teaching method, the students are given material to translate either in class or at home and their translations serve as a basis for comparison, general discussion and analysis. The teacher's own translation is given as a model whenever necessary or appropriate. More recently, over uh, the past uh, two years, uh, in-class activities started to include on-site translation, simultaneous translation and consecutive translation. Course content, more recently the course content is uh, described in the um, course uh, description as follows. The underlying principle is to expose students to a variety of text types, literary, legalist, journalist, scientific, religious, political, economic, etc. in three consecutive stages. The simple sentences, the dramatic constructions, uh, the expanding of the sentence, the linking of clauses, the paragraph, selected text, and finally, the introduction of a small dose of theory of translation, uh, translation procedures, and contrastive linguistics to increase the student's awareness of the various problems, syntactic, semantic, sociopragmatic, involved in translation. In the past, the way uh, my colleagues assess translation is by giving two uh, um, texts at the end of the year, one to translate into Arabic and one to translate into English. Uh, over the past two years, they uh, started to give four texts uh, taken from two uh, different registers, two to translate into English and two to translate. So they give four instead of two, that way they, uh, they give texts representing different uh, types of discourse. The problem I have with the objective is that the first one is that it is not clear what the function of the translation falls in the overall training of the student is. So the objectives are not reflect that there is a certain uh, clear view of what function the translation should fulfill in uh, the general the general overall training of the student. The second problem I have with the objective is that it is unrealistic to try to develop the student's competence in two languages at the same time given the constraints that, uh, that we have to contend with. We have groups of around uh, 70 or 80 students and you have two hours a week and you are supposed to develop the students' uh, competence in two languages, not only in but to make them aware of the linguistic um, characteristic of the two languages, but also of the stylistic uh, variations in, in the two. And I believe that's too ambitious uh, for a course at that level. A question that, that I have and which relates to that is, is it necessary to aim at developing the student's competence uh, in translation into both Arabic and English? In other words, do we have to uh, make our students proficient in translating into both languages. And this is bearing in mind that we are dealing here with people who are receiving their trainees in an English department. For one thing, I believe that the student's competence, my answer to that would be no. For one thing is that the student's competence in Arabic seems to decline to further the advance in their English studies. This is, this is a common phenomenon that we are witnessing is that uh, the closer they get to the fourth year, then uh, the, the less proficient they are in Arabic. And they think that's a problem that we have to contend with and we have to take into consideration when we uh, try to uh, set goals for uh, translation books. And what makes matters worse is that the department has no control over Arabic for its students. The courses in Arabic they take are more content oriented than language with. They are offered by the Arabic department and the Arabic department determines uh, the way these courses uh, should be uh, taught, that means the Arabic that our students take. For another thing, one has to deal with the different types of proficiency in the two languages. So within the same class, you have different levels and you cannot have a uniform approach because of that. 
and to make matters even worse, we have some students that come to us from places like Commission, and they don't even uh, have uh, the uh, minimum uh, requirement to uh, be able to translate uh, from Arabic, let alone into Arabic. Whereas for uh, the third point, the third objective that uh, I mentioned uh, earlier and which concerned to teach students how to remain faithful to the original text without falling into the servility of the translation, at best this seems to be superfluous because I don't really, it does not really give you an idea about how you achieve it, it just gives you a name and I'm not sure uh, what the approach to that end is. This is the problem that I have with uh, translation course as a person who taught the course uh, for a number of years and who is likely to be called to come to teach it again, uh, even though I am not a translation specialist. So this is the situation that we have in a typical, I believe, uh, English department. The prospect. For the prospect, I believe that a reconsideration of the function and aim of teaching of translation in the light of A, the creation of the King Fast School of Translation, whose main function is the training uh, of would-be uh, translations. Okay, so that is something that we have to contend with. It means now that there is a national school that trains would-be translators, we have to would be future translators, okay. <laughs> the second there is a call for uh, the integrating of the university in a socio-economic environment and of offering students more practical training to facilitate their integration into the job market. And that's something that's another factor that is now, uh, that we have as department we have to contend with and then we have to take it into consideration when we reformulate uh, our uh, programs uh, for uh, ourselves and for our students. In the light of these two developments, there is a need for a or a consideration of the options English departments offer to their students. Now, as we all know, a department of language at the level of the first year and a department of linguistics and Anglo-American literature at the level of the second and third cycle. This is what the way I define the English department. What we are offering in the first cycle is uh, language courses. So we end up with being a department of language at the end of the first cycle and for the Department of Linguistics and the Department of Anglo-American Literature at the levels of the second and the third cycle. The problem I personally have with that is that such a department trains future linguists, future literary scholars, would be a habit, that's its sort of thing, and uh, would be literary scholars, but no anglicist, i.e. would be scholars and specialists in the English language. Means people who have that in-depth knowledge of the English language. It means anglicists in the, in the old sense of the term. That's something that English departments are not producing at this stage. The second, there is a need for a reconsideration of the place of translation in the options offered and the offered by language departments. More specifically, determining what the function of the translation course in the overall training of the student in an English, in an English department uh, is or should be. Means you have to face uh, that uh, question and you have to determine what function uh, translation course in an English department should contribute to the student's general uh, training. Other questions is uh, include, does a translation course in a language department still serve a purpose now that there is a national uh, school uh, of translation whose uh, function, uh, as I uh, stated earlier, is to train future translators? My answer is yes. Because for one thing, the school takes only the best at both levels. So you still have students who cannot make it and who uh, have to finish uh, their studies and uh, the translation course in uh, an English department gives them the opportunity to do translation when they cannot go uh, to a translation school. The second reason why I believe that there is a place for a uh, translation course in English department is that translation is a useful skill in itself. This leads me to another question. 
should the aim of a translation course in English department be different from the aim of a translation course in uh, a school of uh, translation? And I believe that the answer again is yes. And here, I would personally set for myself these aims for a translation course in an English department. I would view translation as a way of enhancing the student's um, competence in the English language. That is the first function that I would want translation course to serve, with more emphasis in enhancing the uh, student's uh, competence in the English language. I would view translation as an advanced language learning device or mechanism. That is one way of uh, enriching the, the student's uh, language experience. I would want the translation course to draw the students' attention to keeping and developing their proficiency in both Arabic and English, to make them aware of that game and to, um, to make them um, give it um, its due value. Make the student aware of the importance of translation as an interlingual, intercultural means of communication, a way of knowing the other and of making oneself no, that is something that the translation, uh, that, uh, that, uh, translation course uh, should uh, make clear uh, to the students. In terms of conception, the way I view uh, translation within these limits is translation should be viewed as a skill rather than an art. Or at least a skill before it is an art. We have uh, to, we can't expect students to run before they can walk. We train them uh, in, in the skill of translation, and here it is where I believe that uh, there is room for, for, for developing strategies, developing translation strategies, and giving students ways of dealing with, uh, with, uh, with situations that arise when they uh, translate. They develop some sort of scripts for them that they can use at least at this initial stage. For this reason, I believe that the teaching method and teaching material selection should be governed by the same uh, principles that govern the um, uh, teaching of skills and these involve uh, gradation from the simple to the complex and reinforcement. And here, uh, I, I, I would like to uh, express uh, my, my endorsement of uh, what uh, Dr. Williams stated this morning concerning the different uh, points that, uh, that uh, he mentioned in terms of objectives. The basic aim of translation is uh, to teach the student fundamental principles of translation through practice. Here, uh, very little room for, uh, uh, for theory. It is, you learn by doing. The texts used are to be taken from various fields representing different registers and different styles. So, maximum exposure to different types of, uh, of language. The student should be made aware of the most salient characteristics of the different types of this course and help to develop techniques of dealing with them. These are, uh, in particular terms, what I believe uh, the, um, the job of, uh, or the duty of the instructor uh, a point that I would like to add is that usually translation is into translator's mother tongue. But if the aim of translation in an English department is to strengthen the student's competence in English, then it is probably advisable to confine translation to translation into English, at least in third year, and into and from English in uh, uh, the fourth year. Besides, I believe that the constraints of translation into one's mother tongue probably makes more sense when confined to on-site and consecutive oral translation than when applied to written translation. And anyone uh, who has the opportunity to teach composition to native speakers cannot but uh, confirm that, um, that here this is uh, a sphere where level can be taken for granted is the compositional uh, skill in uh, the language, even if you're a native speaker, you cannot take uh, for granted because it's another thing that you acquire. And here, since we're in, the, uh, in an English department, I believe that the focus should be on developing the compositional skills in the uh, language that the students will specialize in. I'm almost sorry. OK. Uh, I, I, my recommendation is to offer, to 
uh, reconsider the courses that we, that we already have. To offer translation uh, seminars of the type that we started offering this year uh, uh, in Rabat. We have, this is one place where we can start and uh, the, uh, this is an opportunity for students to really get into uh, uh, translation studies. And, uh, and the seminars could be either in uh, translation or translation uh, related with like uh, comparative statistics, contrastive linguistics, rhetoric, philology, uh, uh, lexicography, um, seminars on language and culture, language and society, all these would be uh, contributing one way or another uh, to the students' uh, knowledge that is going to be uh, of value when uh, they specialize in translation studies. Offer possibilities at the level of the third time. They, I think that the legal text offers that as opportunity, that possibility of opening specialties if the need arises for these specialties and if we have the, uh, the people that can offer uh, these things. And at the level of the third cycle, my recommendation is to offer the possibility of, uh, for students to um, offer, uh, to, to study uh, translation. The focus uh, of translation, the main focus should be on training what I would call uh, cultural translators, translation scholars that can do, uh, uh, that can do and can supervise annotated scholar translations of our own cultural heritage and that can serve as intermediaries between us and the other cultures, especially those that use English as their medium of expression and communication. And so, thank, you. thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have three papers left, and what we, what I suggest is that we give our speakers the opportunity to present their papers, and then we go for a break and come back for a discussion. Uh, so our next speaker is Mr. Mahov from the Department of English, Magnus, and he'll be addressing the use of translation.
to invoke the source language and the target language, he must have a solid background knowledge in various fields. He is required also to be prepared and careful in presenting the material. Otherwise, the task becomes boring, as it is often the case. At this point, one of the questions that may be raised is this. Is it possible to do without translation until we get specialists in the field? To answer the first quote of the question, I would say that it is not possible to omit translation from the syllabus by virtue of its central role in the process of language learning and scientific research, as will be illustrated below. Concerning the second part of the question, it is not possible to wait until we have specialists. Note further that even though we have specialists in translation, the same problems will be faced. For pure specialization in translation does not necessarily mean the ability to translate any text in any field. For example, a specialist in translation may encounter the same technical difficulties as a non-specialist if he is asked to translate the book of Darius by chance 1986. One way out of this problem is presumably to arrange training sessions abroad for the teachers of translation. It might be also insightful to organize conferences so as to exchange experiences and opinions about opinions as well as to discuss the difficulty encountered in translation. Such an, an initiative will have the, advan the advantage of refining the teacher's strategy of translation. For there is, to my knowledge, no single method of translation that could be agreed upon and adopted in a unified fashion. Concerning the second factor, which is the material which is selected for translation. So the second factor which affects the student's motivation is related to the nature of the material selected for translation. Most of the texts that are suggested by the teachers do not seem to satisfy the immediate needs of the students, such as developing his knowledge of linguistics or literature. Rather, the students appear to be forced to do translation for no obvious reasons. The result is that the students do not give translation its due importance. The paradox is that the activity is highly scored in the exam. To take the example, to take for example the case of fourth year students in the English department, in our English department, where translation is scored 8 of 20, while applied linguistics and social linguistics are both scored 12 out of 20. This uh, appears to be unfair because students hardly do any exercise in translation outside the classroom, in comparison to other subject matters where much time is devoted. However, if translation is to retain its high score, the text given in the exam should be challenging. Uh, to recapitulate, uh, teachers of translation are supposed to state clearly the general and specific objectives of the course so as to make it enjoyable and instructive. In my view, the general objectives of translation involve the strengthening of the language of specialization, for example, the language of linguistics or the language of literature. Second, the acquisition of general knowledge related to a given specialization. Three, the knowledge of the potential difficulties in translation as well as the techniques of dealing with this activity. Four, the exploration of different cultures. As concerns the specific objectives, they could be defined in the light of the student's limitations in a particular course of the syllabus. This step, however, requires coordination between teachers of all courses for each level on its own. The second point uh, to discuss is translation and scientific research. If the objectives uh, mentioned above are taken into account in the choice of the material to be translated, the students will be well, uh, better equipped to pursue their third cycle studies with more confidence. Note that, note that the scope of academic research is not limited to linguistics uh, literature, but it does also include other branches of knowledge such as medical studies, economy, agriculture, management, etc. Therefore, translation is strongly needed and should be taught in all higher institutions and universities. 
this ambitious step is too demanding because it involves the teaching of translation for specific purposes. To conclude this brief talk, I would like to emphasize the fact that one of the barriers to a serious scientific research is translation. Arab researchers who don't know English, for example, find a lot of difficulties in exploiting the relevant material which is expressed in this language. Therefore, efforts must be made to encourage translation and create groups that have different specializations but implement each other. For example, the translation of linguistic books from English require, among others, a specialist in linguistic terms, as used in the original text, a specialist in the translation of Arabic linguistic terms, a specialist in logic and technical terminology. Likewise, the translation of scientific material from English requires a specialist in the field, a specialist in the source language, for example, English, uh, a specialist in the target language, say, standard Arabic or French. If such groups of translation are created, much time and energy will be saved to improve the quality of scientific research in our country. However, in order for this project to be actualized, it should be financially supported by public and private institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Basil Hatib from Harry Ford University, Edinburgh. And be so terrific about the word competence here. By competence, I mean simply rhetorical maturity. I think that's a, a less trendy term. And rhetorical maturity, I define, doesn't need definition, but one might as well just give it one. It's the ability to perceive conceive and execute in response to certain communicative demands made on a speaker of a particular language. And I'm not particularly thinking of translators here. Any speaker of any foreign language, including even his mother tongue, will be called upon to perform in certain communicative settings. There will be certain demands made on him. He will have to respond to that kind of communicative demand intelligently. That's really my notion of textual content. Now, my basic argument, to bring it back to translation, is really to use translation, the translation class, as a basic workshop to investigate this kind of problem, to train the student into that kind of response, to really expose the students to the various communicative demands made on him, and so on and so forth, while moving from L1 to L2. And my ultimate aim, of course, is that we are not really doing translation per se as an end in itself. We are doing translation in a utilitarian manner as a vehicle that's going to enhance our competence in handling language, in handling language, the mother tongue, for example. This is a sadly neglected area. In handling the foreign language as well. In other words, what I'm getting at, really, we are no longer parasites or unwelcome visitors in English departments. I think we will earn our key we will be operating within a respectable discipline. You see, our problem with our profession, it's low grade, and we keep downgrading it. And I think it's unfair. I think we deserve better. And I think we are operating within. Now, but the problem is, of course, it's, it's our failings. And it is this kind of thing that I personally try to supplement the other contributions, if I may, by proposing a kind of framework. In other words, we've heard very noble statement of intent, especially from our friend from the English Department Rabat. I would like now to put my oar in and say, well, in order to do that, which is really a, an administrative policy statement, we would like a contrastive text industry framework within which the teacher may find himself happier to operate, within which the student may find the operation meaningful. That's the problem as well, because the student is going to tell you, well, what have you got to offer me? It's not a discipline. Where are the limits? And I think we've got all that, provided we start thinking about it, provided we become interdisciplinary, use other insights from other areas, and so on and so forth, but place them within the translation process. So that's really my, my basic aim. 
Now, in order to do that, the framework I personally want to suggest revolves on two basic assumptions. But let me get rid of the silly one, the, the unimportant one. These communicative demands, and by the way, deliberately calling them just communicative demands at the moment, will give them perhaps a better term and a more, more rigorous definition. Place on the translator different kind of constraints, i.e., demand A, demand B, demand C are three kinds of demands, each of which requires a translation theory, if you like, each of which requires a translation strategy. Why I mention this basic assumption, we see in the same day, in the same hour, go from demand A, B, C indiscriminately, and hoping for the best that the student is going to really grasp what we are on about, and what we are doing really, conceptually playing havoc with. For example, this, these notions of journalese is a very dangerous concept. Let's do a term of translating journalistic English. Now, we are ignoring a very, very basic factor, that this journalist operates in at least three or four capacities, including, number one, he or she, the journalist, can be an arguer. In arguing, being an arguer, place the translator under a set of communicative demands that let's call them argumentation. The journalist, in the same piece, is going to relinquish that function and move on to becoming an expounder, a detached observer. Here he will be operating in a totally different capacity. And the demands placed on the text and on the translator are going to be of a different order. He will then move on to really operating in between, that he is neither the detached objective observer nor the arguer. That's here we have a hybrid kind of capacity. In other words, what you are doing by putting in front of the student a passage from a newspaper and saying, let's do journalistic English, we are really asking him the impossible to operate, and without us making it explicit either, to operate in three different capacities. We have three different domains, each of which makes a different set of demands on the translator. And what I am going to argue for later is we've got to separate these three. <coughs> At the risk of artificiality, Let's declare Mondays for argumentation, and Tuesdays for exposition, and to Thursday for instructional kind of discourse, because the three are different. So therefore, you see, we are really. Now, the point is, he expounds. He is a detached observer. He engages in exposition. He is, as a journalist, no different from the scientist when he exercises that capacity. In fact, he is no different from the housewife where she exercises that capacity and actually just reviews a series of events in talking to her husband about it. So in other words, we are really saving a lot of time and effort, we are becoming more efficient, and we are, most importantly, handling these various tasks, various domains of communicative activity intelligently, because each of which is really a domain in its own right. So that's assumption number one. I am not calling for there are these various sets of demand just for their own sake, because each really requires, as I say, a translation strategy. The second and most important assumption I want to make is that our ultimate aim must be to train the translator in handling how culture thinks. What are the modes of thinking which characterizes the operation of a particular culture? You know, it's easier said than done. And this poor term, culture, has really been mistreated somehow. I insist on it because culture thinks in texts, as we have been talking about, and this morning my point really is more or less the same. Culture thinks, let's avoid the term text for the moment if I may. Culture thinks in terms of textual occurrences. Because that's really what we have at the end of the day. It is those textual occurrences that really characterize or display the thinking of a culture. If the students can handle these, categorize them, put each where it belongs, and as I say, use the right strategy in handling each of these textual occurrences, textual occurrences, I'm using a very, a very general term, the students would be really in touch, in tune with the reality of the culture we're looking at. Now, these textual occurrences, and I'm now talking about my second assumption, if I may remind you, which is we are really dealing with text in context, and which comes before which? Other texts. 
these other textual occurrences display, really display, the thinking of the culture. And we've got to aim at that because it's then that we are going to produce a translator who is going to go to the English department and say, well, look, I've got something to offer because the teacher of translation offered me something today. Now, we come to this culture and these textual occurrences. Within these textual occurrences, which display culture, there is really a negligible category, but unfortunately, it does feature very prominently in the way we think about culture. And that is what I call certain cultural objects or static micro signs that characterize the cultural behavior of a certain language community. Let me give you an example. Lists of <coughs> houses of parliament in Britain. The notion of uh, a cup of tea in Britain, or tea, they invite you to tea. So what is tea? It's the evening meal. In Arabic, zaka and tawaf, and so on and so forth. These are very important. They really do cater for about 10% of the way cultures think, but they are really negligible. And unfortunately, they do feature so prominently, particularly in ELT work, where books and books and books and textbooks pretend they are teaching you something about the English culture and all they give you are static, antiquated passages about the British House of Parliament and the House of Lords and the House of Commons. They are very important. We need to know them. The student needs to know that tea is, a, is, a, is an evening meal. Fine. But to me, to my mind, this is really can be gotten in a list because it is static and it doesn't interest me in the least. Now, having ignored that 10%, what is there in the 90% which, to my mind, constitute the textual occurrences, which I'm arguing are the mouthpiece of a cultural kind of existence? The 90% come into what we, I would like to call now, to distinguish them from those cultural objects, macro signs in semiotic terms. And these mac macro signs are I've got the text here as well, which I'm going to use in a minute. But I might as well just use this. What we have is, therefore, I am studying Western culture or the British culture, and my job, really, through my translation course, is to do texts that cater for an understanding of the English culture. I am going to have various textual occurrences of various signs. And let's just settle now. We are going to call them textual occurrences. But these we've got to have some order in those. So I got my cultural objects first. Things like tea, power, zakat, and so on and so forth. This doesn't interest me very much really, it's 10%, although we spend 90% of our time doing them. What is more interesting really in imposing order on these textual occurrences and so on and so forth is macro signs that can be categorized under three basic techniques. Genre, discourse, and text. Here I'm using text properly and I'll define it in. Translators work with these bits and pieces that come into text, but sometimes they will have to really, in order to get the cultural import of that particular linguistic item, they will have to place it within its own genre. And by genre, please, I insist on defining it in my own idiosyncratic manner. It is a social occasion that has found, somehow, found expression in language. The smaller, the better, please. So I'm not talking about sonnets and short stories. That's out, completely out. In fact, I avoid even talk using the label genre for things like editorials and musicals, although it's legitimate to use it there, because it's too huge. What I'm thinking about in genre, and that's we use this category all the time, we've got a lot of textual occurrences coming our way from the source language, and we need to place it under the label genre. Things like, for example, we were translating a piece of literature, and it said, وَكَانَتْ كَلِمَاتُ مَحْكَمًا تَرُنُّ فِي أُذْنَيْهِ And the text is an Iraqi text, we're talking about an Iraqi reality. And mahkama is when the judge appears in court and everybody stands. That is, to me, is a little, nice little genre. Because immediately you stop this word, mahkama, and you say, let's think of an equivalent genre 
in English life. And he said, port rights. So, it's, in English, it's not one word was ringing in his ear, mahkama. It is court rise were ringing in his ear. Two words. That is really a good example of what I mean by genre. To translate that particular source text, you had to really give it its generic specification. If through that category genre, we will really learn so much about so-called English culture in a way that, fine, and the cultural object, you may very well teach me the word auction. Auction, it's a cultural object, but it is not enough. But under genre, you will actually teach me the words that if you hear anywhere, you know it is coming from an auctioneer. He has a special phraseology, if you like. And since auctioneering is known in Arabic as well, one day you are going to come across something in Arabic about enunciated, mouthpieced by an auctioneer. And what you need really is to think of the genre auctioneering in English. So you see, the word auctioneer, when you taught me that as a cultural object, wasn't really very interesting. But the actual words used by the auctioneer in actually selling his goods, when he said, this settles on you, yes, any more, any more, yes, 60, 62, 65, any more, and much, much, much faster than that. Oh, much faster than that. <laughs> That's it. So. But the point uh, is, please, let's define genre in a very small, manageable little units. And really, I gave you a couple of examples now of what I mean by, uh, by the word genre. That will really cater for a number of these textual occurrences. And my ultimate aim, as you know, is really to, to, to translate cultures. The other category is discourse, and I would like also to, to define it idiosyncratically into there are key terms which really provide the mode of expression for an institution, if you like. Racism, feminism, Islamic fundamentalism, fundamentalism of any sort, all these are discursal institutions. Actually, to evaluate is a discursal institution. To engage in objective, detached rendering of a state of affairs is a discourse. Of course, legalistic discourse. Of course, journalistic discourse. And you see here we have the word now journalistic used as a textile. It is not. We haven't come to text yet. I will come to that in a minute. At best, we can speak of journalistic discourse. There are key terms. What do you do with whatever. There are, you see. And of course, open your mouth, and I know what political affiliation you are. You have. I know if you are a racist. I know if you are a Muslim fundamentalist or whatever. How? It's these key terms, cultural code in bad terms, or whatever you want to call them, that characterize the thinking of an institution. It's different from genre, in the sense genre is a social occasion, auctioneering. But this course, it really comes from the thinking of an institution. Again, you have these signs coming your way, and you can place them within the category discourse and translate them within that particular category. Now, this course is worth actually commenting on. It's not really as negligible as genre. But this course, for example, you have a repetition. Now, Arabic is accused of, always, and you know, I have also inclinations that way today, of being redundant, and so on and so forth. There is no such thing as Arabic redundant. You know that. I don't want to waste time talking about the fact that Arabic is never redundant. And Tarif al-Balagha is Ijaz, and Ijaz is one of the virtues of Arabic. Our problem is, and this is really a trend encouraged by so-called Arabists, they don't see that communicative potential. They won't appreciate it. They do not actually understand it. And they omit it. And they tell you about these lexical couplets. Every time you see an Izza wal Karama, one will do. One will not do. Al Izza wal Karama are two basic discursal features. There is a discursal feature there at work. And you've got to render it. And I gave the example uh, if I may, you see, you, you tend to repeat yourself, but we spoke about that in that one, uh, in the Saddam Hussein speech of 17th of July. And he had the whole last paragraph in the speech. Very, very important and very highly repetitive kind of committed discourse. 
committed discourse. You see, that's a discourse of institution. And basically, he was talking about, of course, relying on other texts, such as the Quranic text and the Hadith and so on, uh, under the theme, Allahumma shah, that I am warning you, if you are not going to really see sense, I am praying that we will all see sense, but if you are not going to see sense, I am going to do something drastic. A whole paragraph, highly repetitive, I must admit. A very kind of committed, special kind of discourse. The BBC trans official translation of the speech omitted that paragraph completely. Why? Because it taxed the brain of that poor underpaid Arabist who is translating. <laughs> and he looked at it and he said, oh, this is Arabic rhetorical hot air, you know? It's not hot air. It's a very important statement. And it would have put the whole story to the British policy, policy maker in a, under, under a different light. But that is the kind of discursal values uh, through repetitions and so on and so forth that we really ignore at our peril. And we ignore because we are just simply not prepared to give Arabic a chance that everything has its place within text. Texts are very, very carefully engineered in Arabic. We should really have more faith in our language to start. And you see, by the way, there are many, many lousy writers of Arabic, but don't start by saying this is hot air saying this is meaningful behavior until you prove the opposite. I'm not saying that you are not going to be able to prove the opposite, that all writers of Arabic are virtuous. No, of course not. But let's start from a change the other way and say this is meaningful. Let me try to find the motivation. And if you fail, good luck to you. Then cross it out. But we tend to cross out before we actually think, which is really somebody else's uh, wish to, to demolish something. However, so that is the second category of discourse. But, you know, you, I tend to really great things, and that's a bad thing. However, if you want to ask me where I put my money, of course I will put it on text. Because while genre are very important cultural kind of outlets, really, for a number of concepts, as we explained, while discourse is even more important as a semiotic vehicle for expression, it is texts that, at the end of the day, are the concrete units which we handle as translators. So it's worth stopping there for a minute and define text as a sequence of mutually relevant elements, if you like. Sentences, words, or whatever you call them. It could be a word, it could be silence, of course. It could be a sentence text, one sentence. Length is really immaterial. But so long as you ought to have one important precondition, and that is a rhetorical purpose, or what I call a rhetorical purpose to attend to. You then start with your sentence one, or word number one, or phrase number one, or whatever, and you marshal your thoughts in a mutually relevant manner until you achieve this particular rhetorical purpose. Now, you immediately want to know straight away what are these rhetorical purposes, how many of them. What's fascinating about text as a category, we do not have an infinite number of rhetorical purposes. We really have a finite number, and that's what uh, Dr. Williams referred to today. So we basically really engage within our rhetorical purposes, i.e. text production, in two basic activities. Simply, really, we either monitor a particular situation or manage a particular situation. Put differently, we either non-evaluate or evaluate. <coughs> Put more concretely, we either engage in exposition, detached, unbiased, impassioned, or we engage in argumentation, the evaluative manipulation of concepts, acts to grind. You have a particular car to sell, or whatever. These are the two basic activities, or the two major rhetorical purposes. In other words, if I am going to really argue a particular point through, I start off by making my claims, or counterclaims, or whatever, and defend that until you see there is a threshold of termination, i.e., I have achieved my particular objective. Now, I'll be penalized if I'm short of that, accused of being incomplete, or I'll be penalized if I go beyond that, I will be redundant. 
That's the sense of redundancy. Of course I accept the sense of redundancy. Going beyond the brief stated, stipulated by your rhetorical purpose. Translators work with that. And really, if we are talking about, and some people define the balaba as a fossil wal -wasl. I think translation is the art of a fossil wal -wasl. Let's give it an English trendy name. It's the art of connectivity. It's the ability to really see a text begin and end, and see that thread of connectivity threading its way from sentence one to the other sentence. Now, we do not translate words. We translate texts. And here there is a misunderstanding, including by people like Newmark. Say, what nonsense. Of course we translate words. I think we are, we have been misunderstood. By translating text, of course we translate words. But that particular word will have its place within the element it is in, i.e. the sentence. That sentence will have its place within the sequence it is in, i.e. the textual sequence. That sequence will have its place within some pragmatic semiotic notions such as rhetorical purpose and so on. Your choice of that particular word must be seen within the entire gamut. So therefore, you are really not translating the word, but you are translating the text. That's what we mean. But we get misunderstood as if I'm saying, oh, ignore dictionaries and burn them all because we are not translating words. We just translate holistic holes or text. No, that's nonsense. Of course, we translate words, but these words must be seen within their textual environment. You see, just to give you an example, there is a text, and the text belongs to a very interesting argumentative format in English, and what I call the straw man gamut. Forgive me those who listen to me speak about this, but it's worth repeating actually for those who didn't listen to me about this. It's an ELT problem really before it's become a translation problem, but unfortunately it is really a very, very acute translation problem among excellent postgraduate students I get whose English is unbelievable, whose Arabic is unbelievable. But when it comes to textual strategy, they are hopeless. And they really perform disasters. Nobody spoke about discourse and errors today. But these discursive errors can be really very, very disastrous indeed, especially when it comes from a student whose handling of both languages is perfect. The Strowman Gambit is a text format in English, and, and really I will uh, explain it because it exemplifies what I mean by text. It begins by a claim, a concession if you like. You pay lip service to your opponent's stance, and then you have however, oppose it, and then you substantiate your opposition. That's the basic. You see, this is what I mean by text. The rhetorical purpose there is to counter-argue. To counter-argue, I know for a fact that you are going to start with lip service, followed by opposition, however, nevertheless, etc., followed by a substantiation of your stance. I will not settle, I will not rest until I see these elements, one after the other. You are incomplete if you don't give me the three elements. You are redundant if you go on and on with your substantiation for about three pages, as Arabs do. That is redundancy, and that is bad Arabic, of course. It's not a virtue of Arabic. However, having explained this format, and this is really what I mean by the category text, this is what I mean by culture. This is way of thinking. Now, we've heard, as I say, so much about houses of parliament and all these antiquated concepts. But tell me how many Arabs will see the point in the following text, which begins with the statement, of course, Mr. Major is going through a bad patch. And then it continues. Now give it to millions of Arab speakers in English, and they will tell you the producer of the text is anti-major. While in fact, the producer of the text which says, of course, Mr. Major is going through a bad patch, is an ardent supporter of Mr. Major because that's a lip service concession to those who are anti-major. But actually his aim is to say, however, the man has stood the test of times many times, and then he's going to really have his substantiation and produce his basic theory. Now, this is what I mean by culture. We learn all about the British House of Parliament, but I would like really a, a, a translation course or an ELT course which inculcates in the students this kind of, this is English way of thinking. And as it happened, we will bring in contrastive rhetoric in a minute. This is where Arabic does it differently. 
This is why we have rhetorical conventions that are different, and therefore rhetorical conventions will be a very ideal starting point in us getting into the mind of. You see, somebody really deliberately didn't want us to know how the English think, frankly. I have this conspiracy theory that they busied us with these cultural objects, you know, and Big Ben and pictures and whatever. I would like translation, therefore, to really do even better than what ELP has failed to do, I mean, produce thinkers in little languages who really fluctuate between bicultural, literally bicultural. That should be our aim. Now, I go back to my example to just tell you that, in fact, appreciating the text unit, appreciating the fact that things are in sequence, appreciating the fact that this sequence is whole, is complete, and one part of it must rely on other parts, and so on and so forth, we have this text, which he is arguing, basically arguing, for there, was, there were many peace plans in Lebanon. And apparently, the last one, according to him, is slightly better. Now, he starts the text by saying, paying lip service to the opponent, i.e. to the pessimist camp, who said, look, this plan is no good. And the text starts by saying, the 10th peace plan may be slightly better. Now, slightly better yields in English two readings. Either the focus is on slightly, means it's not really better at all, or the focus is on better, means although slightly, but really there are signs of hope. Now, into Arabic. You cannot possibly handle this element without stop, stopping writing and following the text and seeing where the but is and seeing the but introduces the thesis, but there are signs of hope. Now, you go back and you place the signs of hope, which is his stance in the optimistic theory, then the thesis cited before it was the pessimistic theory, then slightly better, because it came from the pessimist, underlying the notion slightly. Then your Arabic will not be so that you get the focus, that there are those who believe that this last plan does not have much chance of success. However, I believe it is you see, the point is, our choices there, whether we opt for the pessimistic and the optimistic, are dictated by the fact that the text is structured in this way. There is lip service to the pessimist, then there is the strong argument for optimism. It is that strong argument which has placed the pre preceding discourse within the pessimistic theory, and therefore the slightly better within a reading in which it emphasizes slightly and not better. There are here very important syntactic and semantic choices we are making. But we are making them only within the textual framework. And we are making them in a way which reflects the way the English mind thinks. Now, why did I bring in the Arabic business? And that is really something. And may I also just put my oar in. Please, let's, with all my respect to the Arabic department, but let's not wait for far too long for them to come to us. Either we go to them and ask them for, give them a shopping list, or actually, like I have tried for myself, I do it myself. I am bringing into my translation class enough Arabic balaba and Arabic rhetoric as I select it and as I find it relevant. And my class now, uh, it has a bit of practical translation and a bit of Arabic rhetoric and a bit of English text linguistics without actually marking them on the timetable, but the student goes out of my classroom, really, with his brain full of, full of ideas, if I may say so. The point is, he's got what he wants from a number of sources, and that's where translation becomes a discipline, because it is there, the workshop is there, and we have plenty of very intelligent, meaningful contrast and comparisons to make. Let me illustrate this point, and the value of contrast and rhetoric, and the value of, you see, Contrastive analysis didn't work at one time because we were handling the wrong units, but we seem to have thrown away the baby with the bathwater. Because it didn't work, it means any mention of Arabic is a dirty word. We've got to try again, and we've got to change perspective. That's all we want to do. Now, I've got this text there. So imagine I have been doing this particular text I've just spoken about with the slightly better with my students. And of course, they got it all wrong. Really, they all got it wrong. You know, if I test them in their Arabic and English, they would produce dictionaries because they are so good. But 
this business was slightly better and where the focus is, they got it all wrong because they couldn't, they do not look beyond the sentence. They do not look beyond the word. They do not appreciate there is a unit called text and it is structured and it has its own texture. Cohesion means something only when you look at the whole unit. They do not. But they can be made to look for these things. So the following day, we were having another text in Arabic. And this is, a, 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 in fact, it's from interpreting. I'm cheating a bit. But this could have been translated as well. So we were doing this, what we call liaison interpreting, you know, bilateral interpreting. It's a very simple form of interpreting where I and an English speaker exchange conversation. And they, they interpret for us. And uh, the journalist was asking this uh, Saudi ambassador to wait and told him, Alam yahun al waqt li ilgha al jawazat wa tanakul bayna duwal al majlis min khilal al dhaq al shaksiya? And this ambassador said, Al tanakul ashalu shayin mawjood bayna duwal al majlis al ta'awun. Wal muwatan al khaliji la yahtaju ila ta'ashira. Thumma anna al jawaz yu'tabaru isbat hawiyya. You see, good text processing, a person who is really proficient in the unit text and who has practiced it, and by the way, I'm interpreting this into English, so I don't care what the Arabs do. My responsibility now is to my English listener. The Saudi ambassador really wants to make an ideological point, a discursal point within the genre of I am paid by my boss and I am going to really tell you, stop talking about abolishing passports because we have all these Iraqi infiltrators and we have all these. We can't, for heaven's sake, this is a sacrosanct document. Stop making bids to really abolish this document. Now, his main aim, therefore, to say, and jawaz yu'tabaru shay'an shuk muqaddas. That's his main aim. But Arab big politeness. First, he should really have said there, illa anna. But in Arabic, it sounds better to really sort of, you know, beat about the bush a bit and come, come to him through the back door, as it were. Because illa anna is very confrontative. And it doesn't, go with, it doesn't go with the coffee and so on you're having with a very nice, and you want to really befriend this journalist, you know, and all sorts of really sociocultural factors are at work there. So, a good processor now will immediately see the ambassador's game. See, this is, what, this is what I'm after, to produce people, to find people at their game. And as Mr. Batalib said, game is up. That's the kind of processor, not a slave. I don't want translators and interpreters who are slaves of words and slaves of devious ideologies like this, because then the man will get away with murder because we aren't going to be able to find him out. But as a decent prof processor of language, you will see immediately when he used the Jumil Ismiya there, he doesn't believe in it. That's not his aim. It is a concession, really. It is lip service. You can see, in fact, that is not really his aim. But you can see that he is going to oppose that thesis. Now, ideology apart, let's talk linguistics. As an interpreter, the English listener would like to hear a succinct statement. And that is, put the first two sentences straight through. Maybe make them one, and have a nice signal, however, and have your opposition coming. This is the kind of, now, we have a different reality in Arabic. And I have said this, perhaps this is finally, I will make this point. Uh, and uh, Mr. Abdal will forgive me, and those Tatwan, Tatwanis will forgive me, because we made that clear. In modern standard Arabic, I have done a lot of research into this. We really avoid this explicit counter-argumentative format. We condemn or praise. We lack this ability to make a claim, I don't know, it's something perhaps socioculturally to do with our attitude to the truth. Because that is really basically telling a lie and then saying, however. I don't know what happens, but in Arabic, modern standard Arabic tends to prefer through argumentation as opposed to counter-argumentation. 
This is why my Arab students, for example, have difficulty in seeing the counter argument in English. And when, say, when they see a text, Mr. Major is going through a bad patch, of course, Mr. Major is going through a bad patch, immediately they say, oh, well, this is an anti-Mr. Major text, because look at the man, he's saying, of course, he is going through trouble. That's the problem. But to put the record straight, all the Arabic Balaga and uh, people like Qudama and Abdel Nasser and so on and so forth have identified this form. It used to really enjoy a glorious past in Arabic literature. And they say, See? But we lost that. However, we have modern standard Arabic to contend with. And really, it would be nice, therefore, when I'm teaching this counter argument with the text, to take this Arabic counter argument and say, well, look, we do it in this way in Arabic. You are going to have this implicitness in Arabic. It can be misleading in Arabic, but in English, the text structure is more explicit. And in fact, it is, as I say, a source of problems that uh, we have to handle. So basically, therefore, you can see how we work with these signs, such as text, such as discourse, such as genre, as a means of getting at the culture. Because what is culture? So let's exclude those cultural objects. We are left now with a way of thinking of a nation. That is the point about English thinking, English argumentation. Beware, every time the texts start almost a rule. Every time the texts start with condemnation, it means there is some salvaging to follow. Every time the text begins with compliments, you better start getting worried because he is going to attack. <coughs> we don't do that in Arabic, no. We start really, and I'm talking research, and I have a lot of data and findings. I'm summarizing it for you. In Arabic, we tend to really polarize our discourse, i.e. either condemn from the beginning and say, this man is hopeless and defend that particular thesis, or this man is glorious and defend that particular thesis. But you see, an Englishman would like to say this man is hopeless, but he will try very hard to find something good about him and then attack. That is the basic difference, and that is what translation could do, really. If we start organizing our material, take the classroom, the relevant unit, with the other relevant text, whether it's from Arabic, or from Qudama, or Quranic verse, or whatever, by way of supplementary materials, in order to teach this student something about the way of thinking of us Arabs, and the other side. I'm sorry, I took uh, longer than my Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Basil Hatim. Our uh, last speaker is my colleague, uh, Mr. Rahim Zaytouni, uh, who will be bringing us closer to the to a subject area, translation in comparative literature. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think we start exactly from now that I've been conducting this year, and it deals with comparative literature but not in literature. It is Moroccan literature compared to the American or the English literature. Not only the Moroccan, but the Arab literature. And so maybe the, the, the thinkers, if you would, or the peculiar nature of this type of facts does come from the, uh, the fact that we don't have any sort of tradition that would sustain this type of facts. And so I have heard some of my colleagues in some conferences, some conferences, especially in France, talking about the, uh, the, the insertion, if you want, of comparative courses of comparative literature in the English departments in Morocco. And so maybe this is because I think, and I do fully support this view, because I think it's, it's, high, uh, it's high time if you want to start to look inward, if you want, or to look around us. And maybe this is something that, uh, that is very important because it, it would create a sort of interdepartmental uh, uh, cooperation, if you want, between departments, especially uh, between the English and uh, the English department and the department of Arabic literature. And so some of, some of, some of my colleagues in, in, in the departments of Arabic find this sort of uh, cooperation very important 
and they feel highly appreciated to the extent of the say. Uh, they say something that that may look, if you want, very obvious, but its implication is uh, 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 its implications are great. Uh, they said something like the fact that uh, the, the Department of English seems very close to the Department of Arabic. And maybe that it doesn't talk about the, uh, the building of the department, of course, but it talks about the people, if you want to work in, or the subjects, if you want, in this department. And maybe this is something that, uh, uh, that can be, if you want, can be exploited, because they would, if you want, they would learn from us, and we would, if you want, learn from them in the sense that, especially in terms of literature, which is my specialty. And so, uh, uh, as you know, if you would, in terms of the way if you want they teach uh, uh, literary criticism, they teach it in an advanced way, if you want, because in the first year they have got courses of introduction to, uh, uh, to literary criticism, but in the English department we have this course only in the fourth year. I mean, this is because of, uh, uh, because of the fact that we have got uh, English as a third language or uh, not so a second language. And so uh, the way we would, we would learn from, uh, the, uh, from this cooperation or this uh, type of cooperation in terms of research <coughs> is that they would learn, if you want, from us in terms of the, uh, the way if you want to translate, because as you know, the, the courses, especially in literary criticism, the courses in literary criticism in the Department of Arabic are based on some works, if you want, which would be regarded as old fashioned, if you want, in terms of the English literature or English uh, uh, criticism. And maybe this is something that would. Uh, uh, would be uh, relevant if you want in terms of this cooperation. And so maybe to go back to this type of uh, type of uh, comparative study, if you want, that I have been uh, uh, venturing, if you want, to introduce in this department, uh, we, we have, we found, if you want, some, uh, some uh, difficulties, if you want, in terms of and maybe this is something uh, that is very obvious, and everybody involved in this uh, translation would, would find. But maybe the, uh, the main difficulty, if you want, is this uh, uh, scarcity, if you want, of, uh, of references. And maybe the, uh, the, uh, the main problem, if you want, is that the translator, if you want, and maybe here I do think of the, uh, uh, the Moroccan teacher of English, if you want, as somebody who is in a good position, if you want, to, to be dealing with this type of study because he is aware of his own culture and has got at least a substantial uh, uh, knowledge in the English uh, or the American culture. And, but the, the, the main problem is, is that the, this man, if you want, or this scholar, is his own reference. And so he is left to his own uh, uh, conscience or to his own will because he would be the, he would be the center, if you want, and his own judge. And maybe this is something that would be a, 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 that would be a type of uh, violence, if you want, committed against uh, against the work of literature, especially uh, the work of literature in Arabic, if his working language is. English or the other way around, and so maybe this is something that uh, that, uh, that I would invite you to discuss so, uh, concerning this position, if you want, of the, the this scholar of this Moroccan uh, or Arab, if you want, uh, worker in this type of research, and so maybe be, and this is because it would it would be the, the, the mediator if you want, between two works. If you want, and uh, uh, two works, and maybe the type of uh, the type of translation, because uh, I mentioned here the excluded middle. It's not excluded in the sense of exclusion, but it is the archaeological, if you want, medium, because we do, if you want, and maybe somebody or student, uh, foreign students, or uh, uh, 
some of the Latino persons who doesn't have a sort of insight, if you want, in the theory of translation, would be dealing with uh, this type of work without any theoretical background, if you want, uh, in uh, translation. And so maybe this is something that can be uh, uh, can be uh, discussed. And so maybe the, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, mind, if you want, or uh, commonplace, if you want, difficulties of uh, terminology, if you want, and uh, uh, and types of problems, if you want, that everybody in this TV would uh, uh, translation would encounter. Uh, I don't think it's uh, uh, I don't think it's uh, the point if you want, to raise this uh, uh, to raise this point. But maybe the, uh, uh, as my students, if you want to use the term find, if you want to me, is that the, the spirits, if you want, and especially when dealing with, uh, uh, when dealing with works, if you want, of literature, if you want, and especially modern literature, because we have some uh, uh, special, or we put some special, if you want, focus on works of literature, if you want, uh, 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 from Rockham, uh, not uh, uh, specifically. And so maybe the, uh, uh, as the, uh, some uh, students say, the spirit, if you want, of the work is, the spirit of the work, if you want, of literature, if you want, is, uh, uh, is lost, if you want, and maybe this is because of the nature, if you want, of language that is used in, uh, in literature, and maybe this is uh, uh, this would happen if you want in any type of translation act. But maybe the risk in this type of work is greater, or it is just amplified if you want. And maybe here uh, uh, again, because we don't have any sort of uh, you know we don't have any sort of tradition if you want, as I said before, that would sustain if you want uh, uh, if you want. Uh, uh, just to uh, sustain you on this type of practice. And so maybe to, to reduce, if you want, the tension of uh, this uh, uh, generally, if you want, would be, would be for instance, how, uh, would be for instance to quote, to quote the original text, but how do you think, if you want, or how would you uh, 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 see, if you want, a, a paper, if you want, a party, a monograph, if you want, written both in, in, in English, if you want, with quotations, if you want, in, uh, in Arabic. And maybe this would be a messy, if you want, uh, uh, paper. Though, maybe if, uh, if we are dealing, for instance, with, uh, uh, with two languages, if you want, two European languages, if you want, French and English, this would, be, this would not be the case. But when we are dealing with English and Arabic, uh, I think, uh, uh, And so maybe given this type of situation, if you want, in the absence of this tradition, if you want, or in the absence of any comparative, if you want, a branch, if you want, or some department, or even unit, if you want, in uh, English department, how can we, if you want, validate or give credit, if you want, to this type of study, if you want, that would be devoted to comparative studies, if you want to make comparative studies uh, dealing with the uh, Arab <coughs> and uh, Moroccan literature. And maybe this is uh, something that, uh, as I said before, this uh, translation here is acknowledged because, because the critical facts, if you want, in terms of when we are dealing with two works, if you want, of literature, the critical facts, if you want, is dominant, if you want, because the main function of the scholar is to analyze and to compare the two works. And so when comparing, if you want, in, in, in every act of comparison, we are comparing some, uh, two things in the light of something, and maybe this is something that, we, that may solve part of the problem, because when we, we, you are dealing with two works of literature, you are not going to, to compare them in the abstract, 
but you are, you are going to compare them in the light of a, a, a theme, for instance, or a technique, or something like this. But the critic, if you want, is not, and maybe this is why he would take translation just as a medium and not as an end in itself. The, the critic is not uh, well equipped, if you want, with a sort of theoretical background, and maybe the, the, uh, the, uh, the practical side is dominant in this uh, uh, is dominant in this type of uh, work. And so maybe the, I, I may tell you something about the outcome, if you want, because the outcome is very fascinating, if you want, in uh, the outcome of this type of work, the outcome in terms of uh, 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 the ideas, and uh, uh, if you want, and uh, uh, the things, if you want, that we get from this type of work is very uh, fascinating, as I, as I said, and, and it is worthy of uh, uh, our consideration. And maybe this is something that, that we do, if you want, uh, need, and maybe in a faculty, if you want, or in a Moroccan faculty, if you want. And maybe the, uh, this is something uh, that, uh, dealing with this, the question of originality. And maybe this is uh, uh, an background, if you want, in the writing or the Moroccan writing. Because we have got, if you want, and maybe because of this absence, if you want, or uh, and maybe especially with the Moroccan uh, uh, writing, we have got this contact with the French, not the English. And maybe uh, 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 the Arab, if you want, or the East have got, if you want, this, uh, uh, the, this sort of contact with the English literature. And so maybe, as I said before, ideas of background and originality, because we can talk about ideas, if you want, or uh, different themes that, that can be found in the two, uh, uh, two works, if you want, the Moroccan forces or the English, as themes, but, or as uh, uh, philosophies. But where we, we would try to, uh, 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 to examine, if you want, the, the background, if you want, or the ground, if you want, upon which these uh, philosophies or ideas are bent, Maybe we will be, uh, we will be surprised if you want to find that there is not any sort of uh, uh, background in, uh, uh, that would sustain this. And maybe this is this idea of uh, we have dealt with uh, uh, this comparative study in a synchronic way, or it has got a sort of synchronic aspects because we did not busy ourselves in the with the, uh, the, uh, the study, if you want to research in uh, uh, this sort of historical development, if you want, for instance, of the, uh, 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 of the Moroccan novel, for instance, or the American novel, because this, uh, uh, this type of research, if you want, would lead to another area, if you want. And maybe this is why, I, as I said before, this type of work, if you want, can be relevant in this, uh, at least, if you want, here, as a supplementation of the course of translation, if you want, uh, that is given in, the, uh, uh, in our departments, and it would give students a sort of opportunity, if you want, to have some practical work, if you want, on translation, and that's it. Right, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to, to stop for a while and after the break we embark on a discussion of these informative uh, papers. Uh, the break will be a 10 minute one and enjoy it. Some of the uh, 
some of these papers or you know, whatever objection we can, we can start with. Uh, I think we better hold on this. Just make it some somewhat informal. Okay. Okay. Not to do it. Yeah. It's up to you, whichever you please. Assumption 
ذات الاستاذ عربي اللغه الشعريه الشعريه اعني يعني اللغه تعتبر دائما مستوى ثاني لاستعمال اللغه في التبليغ. It's not you know the innocent, it's straightforward uh, means of communication. And that's why, as I said earlier, this, the, the, this interpretational and translational as well process go together in a way. No, we're not ignoring that secondariness. No, no. I mean, you know, otherwise, I mean, what, what's the future, what's not? But in terms of basic text processing strategy, we've got to really. And you see, we, we have no time. And where is this literary translation? Which institution compares the two translators? I defy them if they can do it. Of course they can't. So let's cut our losses and prepare people in some skill that's durable, that will suffice them if they want to be technical translators or literary translators or whatever their hobbies or interests or career take them. This is not really the job of a training department. Our training in six months is to give them the maximum so we train them approximately. Of course, if you want to put it that way. There are certain things which have currency. You know, there are certain units, these units I've been speaking about, they have mileage. And then, you know, you go and do what you like, of course, within, within these parameters we set. And one of the, if I may just end on a personal note, you have these few people, you know, not me, no power. Defies any text linguistic approach. And he would hint sometimes, oh, well, look at it. But I've never had any training in text linguistics. And they use that as an argument against text linguistics. But he has 60 years. I have six months. I've got to come call them. I've got to. And, and I've got to rely on the kind of linguistics which takes me. It's not possible. So, well, not, 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 uh, not anybody who knows the language has knowledge of two languages. Anybody can become one. It's 
going to be not just literature, it's going to be sociology, it's going to be philosophy, it's going to be mathematics, it's going to be physics, it's going to be medicine, it's going to be surgery, it's going to be uh, cookery, it's going to be, just name it, interdisciplinarity means uh, drawing from every, every culture out there, from every texture of currency. And that is a translation. So we, can, we cannot place him, you still, still hesitate where to, where to place him uh, between, uh, between semantics or, or, or pragmatics. You still don't know that. Yeah, actually, I don't want to place the translator anywhere. He should be uh, mobile enough to survive, to survive with what he did. Not to be of a place. When I, when I, when I uh, deal with something with medicine and I go to the Lavus Medical or to Tabel's uh, medical dictionary, that doesn't mean I know a dictionary. When I speak of the hemisphere and so on, that doesn't mean I'm a neurologist. But I know where the, where the where, where, what I'm talking about when I talk of the, when it comes to language. I know where area, what area 7 does and I know what area 13 does and I know so far as language is concerned. And I call on anything, anybody who who wants to, to have some, some, some insight into the field, to do that. So that's, that's very, it's, it is demanding, it's demanding. I just want to point out that uh, the experience has been studied, not in the English department, but in the Arabic department. Now here was I, again, I have been called about 10 years ago by the Arabic department to participate in the, in the course of the comparative uh, uh, and, and the first thing I have done was to introduce translation, translation for literary practices. Right? Because I noticed that so many people translate literary work in the in the in the Malahik uh, and I was uh, I was mulahiking them constantly <laughs> at the same time. So. Uh, so I introduced that as a as a as a, a component. So Said Al-Dush, the Wallach or theory of literary criticism. Said Tarabusi, Adam Kadim, Ulmin Haji. I did technical methods, and the result the result is very very concrete. You have Adam Bidaki whose name appears in our newspaper, who, who described my courses as being the Dorul and the Jalasat Mukhbariya. So what he does is take a piece of literary work and follow it from A to Z, and play from, from article from Act 1, Scene 1, to Act 5, Scene 6. <coughs> Line by line, and looking at all the technical aspects, including the, produ the production scenes, the theatrical aspect. Uh, so uh, I think it is a very, a very, uh, <coughs> a very good, uh, very good uh, venture. It's worth trying. But again, I have to be very, very, uh, very cautious. I'm not saying that uh, I, I was the first one to have done it. So you can always say. I was the first one to have taught translation in Arabic in the department and so in 1970, 1970 for the first time, when, when the translation was taught in French. And I did it as a counterpart. It was a means for me to go for the Arabization of the English department before I called for the Anglo-Saxonization of the English department. We <laughs> first called the Arabization by introducing Arabic translation instead of French. Uh, and then I was called upon by the Spanish department to do the same thing in the Spanish department. Because so that was so that's why I say that if we can think in terms of a global approach to translation in letters, in, in the fact of letters as a whole. Yeah. If uh, I may come in here, Professor Hogan, what point then do you give to the specificities of each discipline? Ah, well, there are specific, the Thought specificities. Oh, I'll, tell, well, I'll tell you now. See, uh, I'm, uh, in 
interdisciplinarity is in my blood. No, because we can look at something Trinity from a distance. Is, and in, is, in my, is in my, in my background because I am a, a descendant of Muhammad ibn Azali, right? Because I am a descendant of Ibn Amira, because I am because I am a disciple of uh, Samashari. So, and I am a curious and intruder of Chomsky. So that's, that's what I, that's what I, when I say I, I think I, I actually, it's an inclusive, an inclusive I. So there are specificities, right? But this is, when I, when I teach a course, I'm teaching a course this year in the history department. I'm not a historian. The history department called on me to bring in the, whatever experience, not expertise, the experience I have acquired through my exposure individually to the historical, uh, the historical uh, storage in general. So my contribution in the history department, so that Larry is doing one portion, and I'm doing another. Larry is doing the, 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 the concept of analysis of the concept of the tribe of Kabila, Zawiya, the Siasiya, the Laharika Sarabiya, which is not my but my role is I happen to have consulted as many books as, as there are about Morocco in English and French and Spanish. The history department felt that I could bring in something so that I'm using the text that are in English and the and the, 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 the procedure is is helping students in history to approach through translation historical documents, uh, uh, for example, the text referring to the occupation of Tangier in, in the 17th century, uh, books by anthropologists like uh, mirages or uh, images and self-images or the prelude to the French protectorate or Kenneth Brown's The People of Saleh, uh, how they can have access to to those 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 things and how to read through even how to read through people like Nasiris Lustiksa who who quotes uh, Castelli or something. So this is what I think translation can do in, in concrete terms. So I agree with you, but I think that what I would call for because this very is going to be demanding. What I call for is a self-training phase for it. I mean, expose, expose myself as much as possible. I share the mujahat kalam, the genre, the discourse, the text, the multi, the multi reading. And the camera kalam is amazing. But you see, I have to be, I have to, uh, to, to, to be uh, uh, relatively prepared. So what I mean by interdisciplinarity in this sense could come from the English department. Interdisciplinarity could be drawn not from the European or the Western heritage, from the Arabic heritage, where interdisciplinarity, for example, for for uh, حتى ينتج علم ثالث ماشي اللي جالس هكا سو العلم الثالث اللي خرج من اللقاء مع الشعوب العربيه هو ان صبحت الان الشعوب العربيه تكشف ات تراديشن يعني هو 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 of the uh, of uh, Asim Palacios uh, on 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 uh, on uh, 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 So I think we have to be very very. Uh, I I I, uh, I uh, appreciate the enthusiasm. I appreciate the uh, the Moreira, uh, but we have to be practically uh, suitable. I'm, I'm sorry yeah, to so much talking into, into language. But this is very, uh, very important, and the students who are today's students will be, will be the future star of what we are talking about. And the majority star of the future, they are going to be the future star of what we are saying. 
in that lip service business. You can't really expect him to go on and on and on. If I am merely saying that, oh, well, he's entitled to ask questions. But really, what I want to say, however, he shouldn't do it here. Now, this entitlement, I can't really spend half an hour talking about these entitlements. Otherwise, the text will change from something to something else. That really, my aim in talking is to talk about these entitlements. My job is not to talk about these entitlements, it's to talk about these non-entitlements. So you can see now, so you can see anticipation is not seamless. There are certain parameters. And by the way, talking of textual competence, I really think this develops. And there are people with minimal, you see, in other words, back to a very basic thing I said, other texts. You see, the more he's, the more the student is exposed. You see, people, I have people who get this format wrong. They have never seen it. But they will see it. And tomorrow, and more importantly, you see, I'm forward-looking. This experience with text is not only that, oh, I've read Agatha Christie. No, I would like them to go out, and when they see an Agatha Christie novel, they will say, ah, this is a title, a potential element one day that somebody is going to use somewhere and for a dream of which I need to really know. In other words, everything around us becomes meaningful. You know, I listen to the radio. I bet you I listen differently from many other people because I look at these Arabic Arabic, and then I know the text producer in Arabic is going to use an Arabic Arabic, and after the Arabic Arabic, you go on and substantiate. But the English, Imagine you are simultaneously interpreting that in a market and you're going to say, certainly. In English, you know that certainly, as text initially requires, however, no doubt it requires, however. Now, you see, now if you can send students home to listen to the radio in that way, I know I'm making life miserable for people, you see, I'm really cutting, cutting down on their enjoyment. But I think if we make people sensitive, everything around them is meaningful, and one day it's going to be called upon. I think we are producing better confidence, you know? Well, it seems to me that you are talking about a matrix. Yes. A matrix, for example, yes. Yes. rules whereby you, uh, you have, for example, if you have something, if you have X, you have Y. Yes. But suppose that the text breaks this anticipation. Yes. Breaks the anticipation. Yes. You anticipate something, but you're wrong. Yes. And this especially happens in literary texts. Yes. When you read the defamiliarization. Defamiliarization. Yes. So when you, it has, I think that when you try to find the matrix, yes. and for example, to go deep into the culture of the language, yes. uh, well, anticipation is, always, is not always the same thing for, for English speaking. No, no. English or handling the literary okay. text. Because my job in that literary text you're talking about is to preserve the break breakage. Not to put it right. It's in the breakage that the quiet poetic value, isn't it? It's that informativity which my job is to preserve. But you see, I need a norm, and this is really a point. Whatever you can't escape the notion of a norm, no matter how theoretical. Yeah, but the problem is that the norm is the, the, the debatable notion. What is normative for me is not normative for the other. That's what I, I, I try to Yeah, but it's a really different debate. And second, perhaps, you know, I mean, contextual, textual norms yeah. are really durable. And I think well, they stand the best of that. I just give an example about the, the maxims, crisis maxims yes. as norms. Yes. For example, the requirement of quality, quantity, relevance, yes. and yes. Uh, all that. But these are, these are actually uh, realized or concretized in differently in languages. So maybe what is informative for me is not informative for you. What is relevant for me is not relevant. So the thinking about matrix in languages is a bit uh, normative, descriptive, and not. Uh, that is, some, sometimes the subjects may plus yes. some, you, even if you anticipate what's going to. But as a excuse me, as a translator, you yeah. are really giving me too much involvement. I don't want that kind of involvement. I am an observer of an interplay between X and Y. That particular X wanted Y to retrieve this intentionality in that particular oblique man. I.e., he wanted his reader to see relevance loudly. My job is to say, how can I make my prospective Arabic reader observe relevance loudly? As 
simple as that. You see, in other words, I am really in between, very much outside of all this. Now, will these readers really negotiate relevance of battle? I don't know. I think that it's the poor literary text, which hasn't established a pragmatic match. But that's really not my problem. My questions are simpler, really, that there is some attitudinal meaning that this particular author wanted to emerge out of some planting of some maximum or other. Will my Arabic reader arrive at that? And if he doesn't, take irony, for example, by the way. It doesn't normally travel easily into Arabic. I'm really in Arabic. Flouting quality, which works in English, like he's working in the garden and in fact he's drinking beer. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't work in Arabic. And what you need, therefore, is to break another maxim in Arabic. By the way, not to add words or explain things, because otherwise you think your Arabic reader is thick. No, but break another maxim. So I think in Arabic, I've done some work on this. What is flouted by way of quality in English, in irony, is made up for in Arabic by flouting quantity. You have more words. Yeah. And very interesting, by the way, on this 18th century, 19th century English literature had a tendency to express irony via flouting quantity and not quality. You remember Jane Austen? It's a truth universally acknowledged. Anybody? It's a truth universally acknowledged. She expressed irony through flouting quantity. Nowadays, I think we are really moving to the flouting of quality. And interestingly, in Arabic, this flouting of quality does not always work. And what you need first uh, is to really flout quantity, perhaps. More words, and so on and so forth. Add some circumlocution of some sort. Make your reader wonder, what's all this? Oh, there must be a reason. Oh, well, you can not be sarcastic or whatever. So you can see, really, the primary aim is that attitudinal meaning, which is over and above the propositional meaning being expressed. My job, therefore, is to hunt for it. My job, therefore, is to preserve it. My job, therefore, finally, is to ask the question, have I succeeded in selling that kind of goods for my prospective Arabic reader? Well, so, you see, we get around the element of norms and so on and so forth, and really, it becomes the problem of the literary text producer, isn't it? Really, I am an assessor of how intentions get transferred, I think. And, God, I mean, you know, our job task becomes manageable. Well, I take the point, if we get into that normative, down that kind of road, really, we can get into sticky ends. Professor Ben Hillam, I do have to apologize for being the cause of this deferment of the suspense. No, 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 it's, it's no problem. I think it's, uh, I was going to ask the question that was uh, just the uh, answer. Uh, I think it, 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 I'll, I have a couple of comments in English. So uh, I think in terms of, of norms, it seems to me that there are professional, uh, probably norms of professional writers that people go write who know, uh, who know the conventions in whatever language uh, we're speaking about. And I think uh, and I think those must be. It seems to me that those must be easier for the translator uh, to to deal with. Uh, and then you have you have the the average writer or maybe bad writer and you get a text in front of you. And then you have to discover the, 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 the structure behind that and the logic behind that text. It seems to me that that's maybe, that maybe is, uh, is, is, is the problem. And, uh, and I have a second uh, comment that was uh, inspired by uh, uh, Mr. Nafisi's uh, presentation and the, on the, on the, on the, in terms of uh, translatability. It seems to me that, yes, there are, there are some items that, that are untranslatable, some lexical items, some, some structures, some cultural notions. But I think, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Hatim said, uh, that I think the context basically uh, deals with that. Even if you have an untranslatable item, uh, the, you can still get the flavor of the, of the, of the text, whatever the, the, initial, uh, the initial writer was getting because of the context. If you lose something, I think maybe that you lose something in one place, and you gain it elsewhere. It seems to me. I'm, I'm thinking every every time I read I read a, a novel on, uh, for example, on Morocco that is either translated from Arabic or something like that, and I read it in English, and I I, I get the exact when it's well done. I get the exact flavor that I'm supposed to get, and I think I think that's that's. It seems to me that that's really not not a big problem. I think instead of really attacking the individual items that are giving us problems, maybe we should look for where we can make up for, for, for them. Yes. 
own uh, electricity uh, uh, a, 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 a striking example uh, in the Arabic construction is ida kana kana ida kana ida when it doesn't mean the the, the, the conditional ida kana ida kana maghribu baladan arabiyan musliman uzwar fi jami'at al arabiya wa mutamad al islami fa inna dhalika لا يمنعوا من أن يكونوا عضوا في المجموعة الأوروبية. There is no conditional here. And when you start transiting with if, then I know your loss. <laughs> and the minute you start with if, and you don't look, you don't have a, you don't have that diagonal look at the sentence, then you. Uh, likewise, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, this sorry. is okay. in the midst, okay. in the midst of. The, uh, the things and I'm also answering, uh, yes. uh, responding to some pieces uh, uh, specialized ESP, and uh, TSP is the translation for specific purposes, so that uh, we, we, should, uh, we should be concerned about that too. Training in the English department, we can train, we can train in the English department, we can train people to be uh, uh, experts or specialists in history, another one in uh, literature. Over in geography, at least disciplines which we have in the in the uh, in the uh, in the faculty, and, and again the specificities of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the disciplines are important. I'm not going to do it myself. I never claim uh, they, they are working. They are working on different disciplines. Uh, one is working on agriculture, one on medicine, one on uh, literature, and they and they. They don't rely. They don't rely on the information I give them, which I can. But they, have, they, have, they are consulting experts, and they they, 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 they go to the school of agronomy, school of medicine. Whether one is working on Lieutenant B, he has to, to, to have appointments with the professors on, on uh, Arabic prosody. I cannot do all that, although I know, and I know that it is. Interdisciplinarity that is uh, uh, when when uh, when I said uh, neurology, I, I had long sessions with uh, Shkidi for quite uh, with, uh, with with another uh, uh, with the Swerp, the late Swerp. I had sessions with him on on the organs of speech. And he, he died, and he still had my Daniel Jones. Uh, because <laughs> 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 I didn't want to find out what I want to do years later, so he had like that. You know, yeah. uh, Mohammed City in the School of Physics has been my reference in, in acoustics, and, uh, and uh, so you have to, you have to, you cannot, uh, you cannot do it anymore. So you do need uh, the TSP translation for specific purposes, and you do. You do need uh, a, a, a training. Uh, As for untranslatability, I find that uh, to be the most one of the uh, Very well said. Uh, so, uh, and translatability, 
but uh, in, there is there is interpretive interpretability. Interpretability exists, but translatability, in the sense that we cannot have one to one ratio, lexically, syntactically, culturally. Uh, we have been, uh, we're still, uh, we're still holding sessions. I hope they have stopped. We have, we still will continue uh, next week. We are finishing. We're looking at uh, Othello. Othello has studied in the English department. And Othello has translated by Matran and by Javad. And you look at the, at the features, the cultural features, which are carried through hunt, for example, through proverbs, through gestures. When when uh, when Iago says uh, figs, a figs end, and he does this, you 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 you, you are not translating Benebut uh, Benebutin because that's that's what he Or or when uh, when he when he plays on, on the word white black and white 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 three three whites when you have white over white and white W I D H T which which means man and 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 weight and black and black uh, black did not mean since Othello is supposed to be black the translation of black is as well but the minute you move into the context the blackness <laughs> disappears and he goes into something else because black is meant, and he refers to ugliness. Well, here, the register which we referred to this morning is very important. The register is also the, uh, is also synchronic <coughs> linguistic. So what does black mean for the Elizabethan period? What does white mean for the Elizabethan period? So you cannot uh, you can you cannot uh, judge by the by the lexical or lexicographical. Uh, Information, the cultural, the, 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 the cultural, uh, or the textual occurrence is diachronic, synchronic, and uh, within the, the register. I'm terribly sorry again, but uh, I know. Yes, sir, Hatma, I you. know you certainly want to react to some. No, not really. But very, very. No, I don't want to monopolize. Sorry, no. But just a, a very quick thing.